Good morning. Thank you all for coming. Happy New Year. I'm Norma Gaver with the Community Recreation Department. I oversee the Farmer's Market. We have Cindy David this morning speaking about butterflies, bees, hummingbirds, and her specialty now that she's picked up, birds. Cindy? Good morning. Good morning. Um, I have two mics. Do I, I have this mic as well. Do I need them both? Okay. This one? Okay. So good morning, everyone. I can wing this lecture because I know it so well. You know, I'm going to add a couple things. I want to talk about the plants that attract bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds to your yard. Not so much the butterflies. Now, I have pass outs that I'll give you at the end of the lecture uh, about uh, hummingbirds and, and butterflies attracting to your yard, but I'm just going to wing it and talk about, I'm going to start with bees. How's that? Bees are really important. We all know that pollination, oh, there you go. Here comes the fire department. They're going to come and listen to the lecture as well. We all know how important bees are. You hear everybody speak about bees. Having bees in the garden, if you have plants that attract butterflies and hummingbirds, you're going to have bees. But there's a couple, just two basic plants that you can keep in the yard and have bees all year. Now, some people might find bees as a nuisance, okay? Because in my neighborhood, we've had to take hives out of people's walls, okay? And this nice lady in the front is saying the same thing. And what has happened in our, on our block is the person next door to me had bees. Then when we got rid of the bees at her house, they moved to the next house. Then they moved across the street and we had to keep, we had to get rid of them. But silly bees, because if they were in Cindy's yard, they could have lived there happily forever. But no, they never came to my yard. I always tell my husband, what happened to me? But they are all over my fire bush. So I guess I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a mess. I'm so sorry, I hope nothing blows away so I can find the fire bush. Now, as I speak today, I'm going to combine things because when I talk about fire bush, I need to talk about everything because fire bush is the answer to anything in your yard. So, this has a couple little berries on it. The birds have eaten off most of them. I have fire bush all over the yard. If you look at my fire bush, the bees and the butterflies are fighting for the flowers. It makes me laugh. So fire bush is a wonderful attractor for bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, and birds. The first phase is when it blooms. When it's blooming, the hummingbirds and butterflies take nectar. And when it makes, and the bees, I'm sorry, and the bees take nectar as well. And then as it makes the berries, which it started on this to make berries, hey! Okay. <laughs> it's just a little windy. I'm glad I braided my hair today. <laughs> As it makes the berries, then all the birds come and eat the berries off the fire bush. So it constantly is doing a job. If you put, if you put I always say this, plant it and they will come. If you put nothing else in your yard and you only put fire bush in the yard, you're going to have hummingbirds, bees, butterflies, and birds. I have warblers right now, and I have little buntings that eat all the berries all the time. And I have birds called catbirds. I don't know if anybody knows what a catbird is. It's a little gray bird with a little black dot on her head. And when she cries, she sounds like a cat. So you keep thinking you have cats crying in the yard, and it's a bird. They love the berries on the fire bush. There are some, and I'm a crazy birder, so I'm sorry. I'm going to delve into that a little bit today. So. I find that some birds will never go to the feeder and eat seed. Now, they are omnivores, which means both bugs and plants, but they don't care for the seeds in the feeder. All the warblers never come to the feeder, but they are all over my fire bush all the time. Little, um, little yellow throats that are beautiful and palm warblers and yellow rumps, so their rear end is all <laughs> yellow. Okay, she asked, how tall would you let the fire bush go? And let me just stop for one second. You know me, most of you already know me, so as I'm lecturing, if you think of something that you want to ask about, you know you can interrupt me. Okay? It's okay. No, I want you to because you're going to forget and then I'm not going to answer and 
Let's just do it that way. It just keeps it going. And it doesn't necessarily have to be what I'm talking about. If something comes to your mind in the garden that you need to ask a question about, ask it because I'll answer it. I've already discussed ja plants in Jacksonville with you today. So her question was, how tall does it get? All right, so the fire bush can grow to 15 feet. And in the backyard, I've allowed it to grow to 15 feet. I've trimmed underneath it and I put some beautiful benches underneath so I can sit underneath it and watch the hummingbirds above my head because the hummingbirds love it. And to me, I just, that's it for me. Let me tell you, nothing else matters. I sit out there, right now I have three female ruby throats, no boys, that's okay because they're so cute and they don't even care that I'm there. They're so busy t being territorial and fighting with each other that they just ignore me altogether. So. You can do it 15 feet and clean it up. You can leave it 15 feet as a giant bush in the front yard. I keep it at four feet. The more you prune, the more it's going to bloom. The new growth is what promotes blooming. So you have to have, you can, you have to trim it back. If you see, I have one by the pool that looks horrible right now. Absolutely horrible. So I'm going to cut the whole thing down and let it come back up. I've had it for 15 years. I don't know if my pool guy put chlorine by it or whatever, he really upset me, but I'm gonna cut it down and let it come back up again. So it's an eternal plant, it's a perennial, and no matter what you do, it's gonna do well. Now, there's only one thing to keep in mind. There's a native fire bush and there's a non-native fire bush. So the larger leaf, when you go to buy it, because everybody's going to tell you it's native, because I'm sorry, nurseries, every plant nursery in the world, I'm so sorry. They want to sell you the plant. No, you have to be specific and tell them I only want native. The non-native has a smaller leaf and is a more profuse bloomer. But I find, and I've debated this with growers, that the hummingbirds don't really care for it. And the, it doesn't make the berry. It's okay if you want fire bush is a landscape or a shrub, you know, just to look at. But if you're trying to attract bees, hummingbirds, butterflies, the birds, you want the native fire bush. And unfortunately, it does grow faster and it does grow taller, but it's a true native and it's drought tolerant and it stands up to everything. So I think that I've spoken about the fire bush as much as I could possibly talk about the fire bush. But here it is. We're going to put it right there. All right, now, I'm still on bees. I know I got a little off track. Like I said, I'm gonna mix everything up. Now, this plant is called Dombea seminal. It's a hybrid of the old Dombeas that they used to grow. Now, this grows into a giant bush and it's a winter bloomer. Now, the regular Dombea, the old-fashioned Dombea that they used to have, the flowers hung down and they would turn brown and look horrible. But this one is a hybrid. The downside of this plant is it's expensive. It's hard to propagate, it's hard to air layer, and it, it's an expensive plant if you go to buy it. So you can buy it small and it's going to make it no matter what you do. It's a very hardy, drought-tolerant plant. Now, it's not for the bee, it's not for the hummingbirds or the butterflies, it's for the bees. The bees love Dombea and it's for your yard. It is so beautiful in the yard. It looks like people call it um, a Florida hydrangea because that's basically what the flower looks like, a hydrangea flower. It gives you a big ball cluster. This is the last bloom that I cut off the tree so you could see it. I put it in the yard because it was a leftover from a landscape. I had too many. I, that's what my poor yard gets all, the, gets all the orphans. All the orphans that aren't used end up in my yard. And I planted it in the front yard. And I'd say now it's about seven feet tall by eight feet wide. But after it gives me a heavy bloom in the winter and summer comes and it, late spring comes, I cut the whole thing down and let it come back up because you don't want it leggy. You want it to be compact. And this is like the best plant for, for b bees. And they just love it, love it, love it. So Dombea seminal. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Maria's asking if it's shade tolerant. I have 
planted it in partial shade. It gets very little sun and it's still blooming nicely. This is just an old bloom. All the rest look terrible. It's almost time for me to cut it back. It's given me a really heavy bloom, but it was nice enough. We just came back into town yesterday and I thought, oh no, I looked at the front of it. I said, all oh, the blooms are gone. I wanted to use it for the lecture and then way in the back, there it was. So see, look at the trunk. It's a, it's a true shrub. It's a very hardy shrub. Now I have some notes here. Let me just look at my notes and see. All right, I did not bring a Cassia surintensis, which is now a Senna surintensis. In the Cassia and Senna family, which, Mike, does it matter if I walk over here, you guys? Okay. So this is Senna polyphyla. This is a Senna. And the Sennas and Cassias are wonderful attractors for all the birds and butterflies. You see, on the road, you see a lot of uh, Senna surintensis planted by the city. There are tall trees with tons of yellow flowers on them. Now, the plus to these trees are the bees love the flowers. The yellow sulfur butterflies lay their eggs on the trees. So you have caterpillars. The caterpillars bring in the birds. So every time I notice on my Senna in the front yard that there's cardinals and blue jays on it, I say, oh, caterpillars. So the poor butterflies work so hard, but it is a lovely attractor. And they all are the same. The Sennas, the Cassias, the yellow flowers, they give you all the bees, the butterflies, Hummingbirds go to the little flowers too. They love it. So it's a lovely attractor, but it is a true tree. The ones that you see on the road, and now hopefully you'll be on the road one day and you'll see them and you'll say to yourself, ah, I remember that crazy lady that was talking about all that stuff. There it is. They're lovely attractors for everything. So it's nice to plant a center or cassia in the yard. I made that a special note because I didn't want to forget about that. Then we have, let's see, I was going to name, I, I guess I'm going to skip around. I told you I was going to be a little uh, nutsy today, per usual for Cindy. There are 10 common butterflies that you can get in the yard. And afterwards, if you'd like a paper, I've made some copies of um, host plants and larval, uh, host plants and nectar plants for butterflies and hummingbirds. I made a sheet. But... The 10 butterflies that you can attract, there are 160 species of butterflies in Florida. And I'm not going to get into every little crazy one that I'm chasing out in the middle of God knows where. I'm going to tell you about the ones that you can get in the yard. So, does everyone know what passion vine is? Okay, we all know what passion vine is, pass the floor. So, with the passion vine, and I, you guys have all taken my lectures a bunch of times, but I'm going to drill it into you and say it again. There are three different butterflies that the passion vine is the host plant for. Now, a host plant is a plant that the butterfly lays its eggs on. Okay? They also take nectar from the flower, but we don't have flowers on passion vine all the time. So, that would be a zebra butterfly. A, fr a gulf fritillary butterfly and a julia butterfly. That's the first three. They all go to that, very common. The zebra is our state butterfly, the black and yellow one that you always see flying around the yard. And there's a native passion vine called corky stem passion vine. And I'm looking around, but I don't see it. It usually hides in bushes and stuff. And the only way you really know it's there is when you see the butterflies on it. So that's three. Next is the eastern swallowtail. Now, to attract the eastern swallowtail to the yard, it, first of all, I want to say that they go to all the flowers all the time. If you have flowers in the yard and you don't want plants eaten up, as long as you have blooming plants, they're going to go to it. I used to say, oh, you have to have this specific plant and that specific plant. The truth of the matter is, the butterfly's whole goal in life is to take nectar and lay eggs. That's all it cares about. So if you have plumbago in your yard and you don't have anything else to attract it, they're going to go to the plumbago. I used to say, ah, oh, they really don't go to Pumbago. No, they go to what they need to go to. It's nice to plant many things in the yard to attract them, and then they're in the yard all the time, but it doesn't matter. So the first three were, 
for the butterflies was the Gulf Fritillary, the Zebra, the Julia. Now, the Eastern Black Swallowtail, which is a beautiful butterfly, and I could start going through pictures, but it's too windy, guys, and I don't want to be chasing papers through the whole lecture. The Eastern Black Swallowtail lays its eggs on parsley and dill, or anything in the carrot family, so rue, um, I guess rue, parsley, dill, fennel. They'll lay their eggs on that. I always have lovely fresh herbs in my garden. So this is my parsley and my dill. I find that they prefer a flat leaf parsley. I mean, if you're really going to get into attracting them and you're really nutsy like me, you're going to plant the specific parsley. Do I plant it to cook with? No. Why would I do that? <laughs> I plant it for the silly butterflies. So this is for the eastern black swallowtail, their larval plant. This is what they lay their eggs on. All right, so now we have four. Then, next, the giant swallowtail. The giant swallowtail is the largest butterfly in the eastern United States. I'm sorry, I usually hold up pictures, but like I said, every time I start to hold up pictures and it's this windy, half of my lecture is chasing the pictures. So I'm just, this was the eastern. I just want to show you this one, of course, because of course I have to chase pictures. This was the eastern black swallowtail. This is the one that goes to your parsley and dill. Now remember, they go to all the blooming plants for nectar. Now see, now I have to go fish through here and weigh it down. I'm so sorry. It's just too windy. I can't do a slide presentation. I can't do PowerPoint out here, so I'm so sorry, guys. What can I say? All right, so now we have five butterflies. We've already talked about the eastern black swallowtail. We're going to talk about the giant swallowtail, the largest butterfly in the eastern United States. When you see it on your citrus, you see, if everybody has citrus trees in the yard, you see this giant swallowtail come in, and then you go and look at your citrus a few days down the road, and you think, what the heck is eating the plant to death here? It's the swallowtail. They, the caterpillars look like poop, bird caca. <laughs> it's to help them, to, to camouflage them from being eaten by the birds. It doesn't work. They still get eaten. They get eaten all the time. But they lay enough eggs and there's enough caterpillars that it doesn't matter. The sad thing is a lot of people see them and start spraying their citrus. I call it nature's pruning. Nature's pruning and it won't hurt the tree. Just think about it. Remember how I always say, the more you prune, the more it blooms. So. Just think of the caterpillar as pruning the tree for you. I know you're smiling. You think, oh, crazy, Cindy. You guys know I'm crazy already. So, All right, so uh, I love you guys, too. Thank you. Um, so that's five. Let's see, number six. Oh, let's see, sulfurs. There are two different kinds of sulfurs. Those are the ones that are going to go to all of your cassia and senna trees. They're yellow. There's the common sulfur, which is a little smaller. There's the orange barred sulfur, which he's larger and a deeper yellow with orange inside his wings. And there's the cloudless sulfur. He almost looks transparent, light yellow kind of green. Those are what are going to go to your cassias and senna's, and they're beautiful, and you'll love that. And you won't even notice that they're there. The best part about that is the birds come and eat all the caterpillars. So you have birds in your trees, birds in your trees. I have Orioles who have made a nest in my, they just started to make the nest because spring is coming and they're all out there making their nest in my cassia. I am so excited. It is like Orioles all the time in the yard. I have people when I'm out doing my crazy bird watching and I run into people from all over the world and a gentleman said, oh, I'd love to come sit in your yard, some stranger. And I thought, yeah, this is before I had the nest. I thought, yeah, I'm going to have some loon come sit in my yard and wait to see an Oriole all day. And what if it doesn't show up? But I don't know if you, I'm not going to do the bird call because then you all really think I'm crazy. But <laughs> no, 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 look, yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> my husband's even over there laughing at that one. So... At any rate, let me just see. What else do I, what else is an attractor? So we're up to six. We're up to six. Zebra, Fritillary, Julia. Mm. 
What else do I have in the yard? Is, uh, what else? I, I only did six. I've got to think about this now. Dutchman's pipe. Dutchman's pipe. All right. Dutchman's pipe is a wild plant that has a giant flower. It's for the polydamus butterfly. It's the only butterfly that doesn't have, only swallowtail that has no tail. They call it gold rim. So it's a big black butterfly with a yellow band on the bottom. Also a beautiful butterfly. Now what we're talking about is things that are really easy to attract to the yard. So that would be a perfect, perfect plant would be the Dutchman's pipe. Oh, guys, what's wrong with me? Milkweed, 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 milkweed. Any butterfly gardener knows milkweed for the monarch and the queen. Now, when you have the monarch and the queen caterpillars on your plants and they will, see, that's why I don't have the pictures out. They will defoliate all of your milkweed down to sticks, but don't be afraid it comes back and don't be afraid to cut it. There's a couple of problems with this. It's going to look ugly in the garden. It just is. Come back. Don't leave. <laughs> come back. Come back. I'm not done. You're all wilty, but stay. Um, that's going to look ugly in the garden. Milkweed gets eaten down to nothing to stick. So maybe here's, I'm going to backtrack. I told you I'm going to talk about different things. The first thing is with a butterfly garden, you don't want to put it in the corner of the yard where nobody's going to see it. What's the sense in having it there? I always believe that your butterfly garden should be planted and you need to think about this, a window that you are going to look out at your home. So you have to think, okay, here's my kitchen window. I have some planting area here. That's where you want to put your your butterfly gardener. I have glass doors in the back and I sit in the living room or in the family room and I can see outside. That's where you want to put it. Now with that said, you want to plant your pretty things up front and you want to put your milkweed in the back of the garden. You'll see the monarchs coming to it, but then when it sticks, you're not looking at sticks in the front of your garden that look yuck, right? They just look terrible. You want to be able to enjoy the butterflies, but you don't want to have to deal with, with looking at nothing. Now, if your milkweed doesn't look good and they've eaten it down, cut it in half. Where you cut it is where the new leaves are going to come up from. So you have to keep that in mind, okay? You have to keep that in mind that if you cut it down low, then you're going to have new growth coming up. If you only trim the top of it, then you're going to have this big long stick with a couple little leaves on the top and it's going to get eaten up right away. It's going to be gone. All right. So I think I'm up to eight, I hope, butterflies now. And thank goodness I brought the sheet to pass out because I needed it for myself. All right, so we talked about passion vine, citrus, milkweed, Dutchman's pipe, cassia and senna's. I don't know if I hit all the butterflies I wanted to. Zebras, butterfly area, 10 common butterflies. I did that. Well, I could talk about butterflies the rest of the lecture, but I'm going to move on. I'm going to talk about hummingbirds because I love hummingbirds and I love them in the garden. All right, so hummingbirds are migratory. So we have to keep that in mind. Usually, and, and Crazy Cindy, here we go again. We know how crazy I am. Crazy Cindy marks the date that she sees her first hummingbird in the garden. This year it was very warm and I didn't get hummingbirds until mid-October. Last year I had my first hummingbird September 7th. The other thing that you have to keep in mind is Let's say you're out there and you see a hummingbird in the garden and it's the 1st of September and you're all excited, it's in your garden, wow, I've achieved what I've wanted to achieve, this is great, and then you don't see it again. They're passing through, they're migratory. Those little suckers go to the flight of the islands. They'll come in and take nectar, 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 nectar for a day or two to bulk up and then they head out. But by the end of September, beginning of October, you should have hummingbirds if you plant the right plants. And it is true, you need to plant specific plants to attract hummingbirds in your garden in Florida. A hummingbird feeder doesn't really work well down here. If you're in North Carolina and you put out a hummingbird feeder, you have 10 hummingbirds fighting over the feeder. I do have people tell me that on occasion they have hummingbirds go to their hummingbird feeders down here because they choose not to listen to me and plant the right plants. <laughs> um, but you need to plant the right plants to attract the hummingbirds. And I used to say that they don't come down lower than three feet, 
but I have shrimp plants in the yard and I watched the hummingbird this morning and she went right down to the bottom like a foot off the ground to take nectar. So I'm going to show you key plants, very key plants, one specifically for hummingbirds, okay? This, and I'm sorry I didn't cut off, I wanted to keep it there for my hummingbird, so I just cut one little plant. And I'm going to walk around, you can pass it around. This is called fire spike. You usually see it in red, but this is a purple, and it comes in a light purple as well. And it is the best hummingbird plant. They absolutely love it. I'm going to walk around here and I want you all to pass it around. This is hasn't really opened. It does grow into a big giant sprawling bush but you can cut it back and it's drought tolerant and just when you think it's gone just it comes right back again. So it's called the botanical name is Odontonema and look everything's flying away and the common name is fire spike. I like the purple because the purple is a winter bloomer. The purple and the light purple are winter bloomers, whereas the red is more of a summer bloomer. Now, we were up in Loxahatchee in the National Park there, and they have a big sign that says, all natives. And I'm standing with a lady and I said, oh, Odontonema. She says, oh, what is that? I said, a non-native that you have in your garden. She says, shh. Don't say anything, please, because they'll take it out and then we won't have the hummingbirds to take pictures. It's a non-native. Just say fire spike. If you say fire spike, they'll know what you're talking about. I'm happy to spell odontonema for you, but here's the sad thing about plant nurseries. The people that they hire usually don't know the botanical names. They only know the common name. I'm just taught by older gentlemen in the business to always use the botanical name because fire spike can have 15 different names but if you say fire spike they'll know what you're talking about the red is more of a summer bloomer the purple is the one that you really want for the hummingbirds and I promise you you'll have hummingbirds in the yard if you plant that they don't care about shade or sun next is the shrimp plant now I clipped an old one, again because I want my hummingbirds in the yard. This is a red shrimp plant. I want everybody to look at this because this is the easiest sucker to grow in the whole world. Okay? You plant this, everybody buys those yellow shrimp plants and they die. A year, two years, they don't even make it two years. The sad thing about the yellow shrimp plant is nematodes that are in our soil kill it. Just like exoras. People don't plant the big bush exora. They plant the smaller Taiwanese exoras. Oh, they're so cute. And after two or three years, they think, what did I do wrong? I fertilized. I've done everything. Forget it. The nematodes are eating the roots in the soil. There's nothing you can do. The yellow one gets eaten. This one becomes a little invasive, but I don't care. You see it sprawling one way and you think, where's it going? And then the next thing you know, it's moved all the way over here or it's moved all the way over there. Or in my front yard where I have no shrimp plants, I have two coming up. I was like, hey, okay, I love that. But now, I, I cut an old one because I like my hummingbirds on it. When you look at it, when it's in bloom, this is really part of the leaf. It gives you little white flowers that come out and that's what they go to. This shrimp plant is easy to find. Most nurseries carry it, easy to grow, and it's just a lovely plant for hummingbirds. You will never see a butterfly on this because the butterfly's tongue, the proboscis, won't come, doesn't go in deep enough to the flower. It's the same thing with the fire spike. Although, when we were up in Loxahatchee, I saw some zebras on the fire spike, so I may be wrong, but as a rule, you never see butterflies on fire spike or the shrimp plant. Now remember, we're talking about hummingbirds. These are plants specifically to attract hummingbirds to your yard. So the next one, and their absolute favorite, is the Chinese hat. Now, if you want to know the botanical name, it's Holmskodolia, but we won't even go there. We'll just call it the Chinese hat, okay? I have Chinese hat all over the yard. Did I want Chinese hat all over the yard? No. It decided to take over. It will take over. It's a sprawler. It has, it, the, the growing pattern is the same as a bougainvillea would be. 
so it has that sprawl of the bougainvillea. But what happens is it gets heavy and it touches the ground and wherever it touches the ground, it makes another plant. So I've been potting them up. They're all over the yard, but the hummingbirds, and I'm gonna pass this around too because this is really nice. I want you to look at it closely. This one here, these are older ones on the top. This bloom right here with the little throat here, that's what they go to. So let's pass it around. And here it is here too. I'm sorry they're getting wilty, but this is called Chinese hat. It comes in a yellow, it comes in a purple, it comes in an orange, and it comes in a red. I have the orange and red. I have seen them go to the yellow and the purple. But these three plants, these three specific plants, the hummingbird, oh, and firebush, let's go back and talk about firebush again, and good old firebush. These four plants the hummingbirds love, and if you put them in your garden, I promise you, I promise you in the winter, you're going to look out at your garden and say, oh, a hummingbird, Cindy was right, that's right, Cindy was right. So, if you choose not to plant anything, and I'm going to say this probably another six times during the lecture, if you choose not to plant anything else in your yard as an attractor for bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds, just native firebush. Okay, so if you just put in native firebush, you're going to have everything. Everybody loves it. Yes. Oh, listen to this. Okay. Let's let the ambulance go by. Okay, she said, Cindy, do you mean all the breeds of hummingbirds? Will I get them all in the yard? No. The only hummingbirds that we get in Florida, in Miami, are the ruby throats and the rufus. The rufus is a brown little guy and you really won't see him. And then there's a really rare one called a buff belly that I have wonderful pictures of, but he's not back this year. And he goes to Costello's Hammock. You all need to write this down. Costello's Hammock. It's out in the Redlands. There are at least 20 hummingbirds there all the time this time of year. You, they'll dive bomb you. They'll fly around you. They're wonderful. Costello's Hammock. Two years ago, I took wonderful pictures of the buff belly. I was able to, uh, I won a little award and a little contest for it because everybody said, oh my gosh, where did you get that picture? I know what plants. I'm telling you, plants make a difference that it went to a plant called a pavonia. Now, I didn't bring my pavonia because it had no blooms, but a pavonia is another hummingbird attractor. Pavonia has a little tiny yellow flower that almost looks like a hibiscus, but it's not, and the hummingbirds love it. And I knew that if I sat by that pavonia all day, that buff belly was gonna come, and sure enough, and I got the pictures. So no, none of the beautiful purple throats, none of the beautiful ones that you see, the Annas, which is just magnificent. No, I get tortured from friends in Arizona who send me pictures of all the different hummingbirds they have in their yard. Most of the time, all you're going to see in the yard is a ruby throat. Go ahead, yes. Oh my gosh, at least 20 or 25. I don't know, Wendy, you're going to have to look that one up, kid. Pavonia, P-A-V-O-N-I-A. It's a native. Not many people are growing it. More people are growing it now than they used to. Weber's Jungle Garden. Leslie Weber grows it. Weber's Jungle Garden. And another plant nursery called Silent Native. Now, you'll be able to find them. They're both wholesalers, but they both will sell retail. Pavonia grows into a big bush. You can cut it back. It is not the most attractive plant in the world, but the hummingbirds love it. If you're really into attracting hummingbirds to the yard, then you can put a pavonia in the yard. Okay, next. This is really sad. You all are gonna laugh. I don't like to cut my flowers because I want them there. <laughs> so here was an arm with a little, this is a jatropha with no leaves. I was hoping they had a jatropha in here somewhere. And I looked all around, but there's not. So all I have is the flower, but it's a pretty common flower. People know the jatropha. 
The Detrofa's lovely. It's poisonous, so don't lick it. <laughs> don't let the sap touch you. If you have grandchildren, which we do, I don't let him get near it. But it's a lovely plant. You see it in everybody's yard. It's an old common Florida flower, grows in a bush. It gets a little bug problems, which, okay, I'm going to tell you all my, the secret Cindy spray. Here we go. Every time I talk about bugs, I tell you this. I try to use a natural spray for everything that I grow. Before I go to pesticides, I make my own mix. And here it is, a gallon of water, a tablespoon of vegetable oil, a tablespoon of dish liquid, and a tablespoon of Epsom salts. Mix it up and put it in a spray bottle, and that will take care of pretty much everything. Shall I repeat it again, or did we get it? Yes. Repeat it again? Okay. Gallon of water, tablespoon of Epsom salts, tablespoon of dish liquid, and tablespoon of vegetable oil. That kills aphids, it kills mostly everything. Now, do I move on to something else? It doesn't always work. Sometimes you might have such an infestation that you're going to need more. So the next thing I move to are two other things that I try to use that are natural. I like to use a safer soap, which you can get in Home Depot or anywhere, a soap spray, or I use neem oil, N-E-E-M oil. Now, after that, I go to the bad stuff. I use, um, it's a bear spray. It's, the product is Merit if you use it as a commercial spray, but it's, it's bear. You'll see it. It's a blue container in the store and it's a systemic. So if you spray it on the leaves, the plant takes it in systemically and it gets rid of everything. But I only use that as a last resort because it's, it's not nice. It's, bad for us. It's not healthy. So try the natural. Oh, and then the next thing is when you spray, spray it, wait seven days and spray again, and wait seven days and spray again, three times. Because if there's eggs, remember there's a shell. So it hasn't emerged yet and your spray is not going to affect it because it's in a shell. So as it emerges, and you'll have more of the bug, you're gonna to wanna to spray it. So just repeat three times every seven days, three, three applications, and that should do it. Okay, let's see. Oh. By the way, guys, here's the leaves for the odontonema for the fire spike. This is what the leaves look like. All right. Oh my goodness, I really wait, yes. I spray on the leaves, the flowers and the leaves. And I get, thank you, thank you. See, I always tell, you came in a little late, but I always tell people, please interrupt me and ask the question because it's going to make me think about things that I didn't say. If you can, and you can't always do this, look at the underneath of the leaf. Try to get up underneath because they get on the vein and suck the life out of the plant from underneath. And thank you, because I wouldn't have thought to, to say that, and that's, an, that's necessary. All right. Poor Salvia, poor little Salvia, got mashed from everything. This is, <laughs> this is really sad. This is a Salvia, this is a native Salvia. Native Salvia is wonderful. It'll spread all over the yard for you. It grows no matter what you do. Now, originally I had white and I had red Salvia, but I also have bees, so bees pollinate and mix it up. So I now have pink red and white salvia because they mixed it up and I ended up with a bunch of pink. And it will grow all over the yard. It will seed itself. It's a lovely, lovely little plant and it's native. So just when you think all the salvia is gone, a couple weeks later you'll look some, at some other spot in your yard and there's the salvia again. So salvia is a lovely plant for bees, hummingbirds, and butterflies. Yes. I didn't mention Lantana, and let me look at this so I can mention everything I didn't mention. I didn't talk about Lantana, which is a lovely plant and a lovely attractor. I don't usually find the hummingbirds on the Lantana, but we all know butterflies love Lantana. Lantana is an easy plant. 
the yellow, the gold mound, and the purple on the ground are not as much as an attractor as the multicolor, the confetti and the other ones you see. If you look out in the wilderness, if you're tromping through the wilderness, my husband always laughs. He says, look, there's a lantana. That's, those are the orange and yellow together. That's the true native. They're very, very poisonous. So don't eat it. Don't eat it. And we'll be okay. Then... <laughs> The ones that have more blooms are um, the confetti. There's one that's pink, yellow, orange, all in one flower. Okay, pintas. I didn't mention pintas. I have red pintas in the yard that I've had for years. The, na the, the true pinta, not the ones that you get at Home Depot that only grow this big. The true pinta, the red, the ruby red pinta, grows to five feet if you allow it. Uh, that's a lovely plant for the yard. Not always easy to find. I'm going to plug a nursery, Elagua Nursery, down off of Sunset. She always has red penta. I love her for it. I bugged her to buy it, and she said, she's thanking me. She said, Cindy, you brought me all the butterfly nuts. They all come in and buy it. But the, the hummingbirds love that, too. Oh, you know what? It must have blown away. Nope, here it is. Oh, I'm sorry. It's very wilty. There's a little purple flower in the end, porterweed. Porterweed is, this is not native porterweed. Native porterweed grows up to maybe two feet on the ground in a big full bush. Porterweed is a lovely attractor also for bees, hummingbirds, butterflies. Everybody loves it. Porterweed is a great plant. And that's it. I think I covered everything. Porterweed, pentas, firebush, duranta. Duranta or golden dewdrop. I didn't bring it because it wasn't blooming, but they call it golden dewdrop. The hummingbirds and butterflies love that as well. That's also a good plant. So now I, oh, and the last thing, last but not least, what time is it, everyone? Oh, I have 20 minutes. I can go on a little longer. Coffee. This is a native coffee. If you walk around the corner here, that bush on the corner, one second, one second. This is Bahamian coffee. They both produce a flower and a berry. The hummingbirds and butterflies love it when it's flowering, and the birds love the berries. This is Bahamian. It prefers more shade. You see they have it in the shade, and they've cut it like a bush. It also produces the same flower and the same berry as the native coffee, which also prefers a little shade, but does better in full sun. And this is for the hummingbirds, the bees, the butterflies. Like I said, when it's in bloom, everybody lands on it. And when it has a berry, all the birds come and eat the berries. So it's a lovely plant. I use it for hedging now. They've taken so many things away that we're not allowed to plant anymore. I use my coffee as a hedge. And you can see it makes a beautiful hedge. It's just the Bahamian prefers a little more shade, and the native doesn't care. You can put it out in full sun. It does exceptionally well. Okay, so now we're at the point where I say, ask me whatever questions you have for the garden. Okay, here's your chance. You have a plant with a problem? Yes. Elegua, E-L-E-G-U-A. I believe it's on 123rd and Sunset. She has very, very fair pricing. They're always very busy because they have very fair pricing. They're a lot cheaper. I'm, I know I'm not supposed to. They're cheaper than Home Depot and everybody. And she carries all kinds of hummingbirds and butterfly stuff. A lot of natives. She has a lot of natives. But remember, if you really want natives, Weber's Jungle Garden. She grows all the natives she grows for. You know the tree giveaways that Dade County does? She's the one that grows for that. So she has all the natives there and a lot of trees and stuff. But I'm sorry to say she's all the way out on like 197th and um, 248th. So, but she has beautiful stuff. Native, 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 native. Anybody else have questions? Weber, V-E-B-E-R. Yes.
Patty Fair and all of you. Yes, yes. And you? Great. Okay, what was the date again? Leap Year Day, February 29th, the Native Plant Society is going to be here. They're wonderful. They will guide you. Are you going to have plants to sell? And silent native and, and I don't know. Do you know of anybody else who would have natives? It's hard. Natives? Okay, Shell Lumber has a small selection and you have to ask. Here's the thing. I have been guiding Eligua for 10 years now. And it was first the mother, Carmen, and now the daughter, Navi. And they've really started to put in natives for me because I've pushed, pushed, pushed. I love natives. And I plant, I would say 70% of my yard is natives, but 30% is not because I want to attract everything. And I just, some things just don't attract, you know? And the truth of the matter is you're better off planting native because then you don't have as many issues. You don't have as many bug issues. It's more drought tolerant. But a lot of times natives aren't gonna give you the blooms that the non-natives do. So like I said, up, if anybody goes up to Loxahatchee, shh, don't tell them that their fire spike isn't native because they'll pull it out. <laughs> Any other questions? Ah, uh, you have to ask Michael. Yes. There you go. So it'll be on the Carl Gables channel. I don't know how often they play it, but okay. Yay. Yay for me. Yay for me. So the last thing is, I never give a plug for myself. I never talk about landscaping, but today I'm going to say if anybody wants a consultation or a landscape, I'm happy to give you my card. Right now, I am doing a few landscapes, um, what I love to do, but I'm also consulting for Dade County on their natural areas along the highway, which is really nice for me because, believe it or not, you would never think up in the Gratney. Um, on 924, there's five or six areas that it's, if you put it all together, it's about 100 acres. And I stood there and watched a bald eagle up above my head. And there's a short-tailed hawk in another area. And there's hummingbirds in another area. And these places are sometimes behind walls and in areas where everybody's just passing by on the expressway and they don't get to see them, but they're so wonderful. I really feel fortunate, yes. Owls? Oh, I don't even know about an, okay. So he's, I always have to repeat the question. I have to remind myself. He's asking, do I suggest putting in nesting boxes? Now, my birding buddy put nesting boxes in her house and she's in Pinecrest. She has a large backyard and she has the little screech owls in them. And I love it because they stick their little heads out, you know? I just love them, but the downside to the boxes are, and I found this because I've gotten calls to consult on this, is the bees love to put their hives in the nesting boxes. So you end up with tons of bees, and then you've got to hire a beekeeper to get the bees out, and then you've got to clean it out. And as for hawks, I've never heard of that, but you're going to make me look for something. I always love to learn something new. Well, they, there's bat boxes everywhere. Everybody has, and that's not a necessity either because the people that live across the street from me have giant pillars out on their, on their terrace and they have bats. So you can sit at night on, in, in a chair on their terrace and you watch the little bats come up and they kind of look like they're dropping and they take off. They must have a hundred bats and I love it. I love it. Little seminal, brown seminal bats that are really cute because I'm crazy and I love it all. Ask my husband, we were up in Merritt Island, I'm chasing hogs to take pictures of hogs because I'm crazy. Okay, well, I think that's it. Let me see, let me just check my notes real quick. Hummer's fire bush, oh, palm nuts. Okay, do you have palm trees? If you have palm trees, Adenidia palms, the Christmas palms, when they make the berries, don't cut them off, leave them because the squirrels and the Orioles love to eat them. You will have Orioles in the yard eating those berries. So that's just another little note that I wanted to say. And I think that's it. And you had a question. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, 
She's asked, he just asked, how often should they water tomato plants? Feed the tomato plants. You want to feed them before, while they're blooming, but not when they're making the fruit, because then, they're go then you're eating the, what you're feeding them with. So feed them up to the point of blooming when they first start to make the fruit, stop feeding and just water, okay? The other thing is watch for hornworms. You want to use dipel or thuricide, which is a bacteria that doesn't affect us. You can use that up to the time that you can harvest it and still be using dipel and thuricide, okay? Keep that in mind because a hornworm will eat your plant in one day, you know? Trust me, I've been there. <laughs> And yes, 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 papayas. Okay, so do you have a male and a female? It does, it's self-pollinating, so it's male and female? Then you should have no problem unless you have white fly. White fly will eat the little bloom at the end and it'll fall off. Do you have blooms falling off? Yes, that's white fly. You need to spray it. Use my natural spray to start with. Okay? Uh, Epsom salt, a tablespoon, that one. Okay? But that's Epsom dish liquid vegetable oil. Okay? And you can use that up to the day of harvest. But if you have the blooms or the new little fruit falling off, that's because it's white fly. Sometimes you'll open the fruit and you've got the white fly in it. It's really gross. Lots of protein. Protein, protein. Okay. That's because of the white fly. You need to look at it. Spray your plant, okay? When it's getting ready to keep it sprayed, okay? All the time. Okay. No other questions? Okay. Thank you so much. What, what? Oh, wait, one more. Yes. I don't know why. I still haven't figured that out, and I've debated it with people. And they come to your feeder. A lot of them, are they constantly, const like once in a while you see it. <laughs> okay, so you see? I on occasion they do, but I find that you, if you plant the plants, you don't need the feeder. Plus then you don't have to clean it and everything else. But it's not like it is up north. It's just like on occasion. Yes. See, that's the truth. They, there's so many plants that we offer blooming. That's the same thing with butterflies. I don't know if you were here at the beginning of the lecture. I used to say, oh, they don't go to this and they don't go to that. The truth of the matter is they're going to go to whatever has nectar because that's what they need. They need the nectar. So whatever you have in your yard that's blooming that they can take nectar from, bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, they're going to go to it. It's everywhere. So I used to use, as a hedge, Lakeview jasmine, Myri. I loved it. And there's still old Lakeview jasmine, but they say that Lakeview jasmine brings in the state. You won't find it in nurseries anymore because it, ha it brings in citrus greening. So you can't plant it anymore. And now they're saying, I read a little article that isn't widespread yet because they haven't confirmed it, that the cherry hedge has a problem. The Suriname cherry has some problem bug that's going to affect somebody somewhere. So I feel like the main hedges that I love, they take away from me, you know? So that's it. All right. Anything else? No. I'm sure the cook wants to get in here and I've talked your ears off. Thank you. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. We're doing the cooking demonstration today with Dr. Sandra Leva, and she'll be doing a bone marrow soup and showing you different bases to start um, to start preparing these um, delicious soups that are coming up uh, more frequently nowadays. But again, thank you for coming. Happy New Year. Good morning. I'm Norma Gavarette with the City of Corey Gables Community Recreation Department, and I have Dr. Sandra Leva. 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming out here. Uh, it's such a beautiful day. I see a lot of you. Uh, I know some of you from a lot of the other uh, farmers markets, but Coral Gables is a very special place. Um, thank you so much for having me and coming out. Uh, I am Dr. Sandra Leva. I am a doctor of oriental medicine with a specialty in homeopathy, but I do not practice. My field of expertise is really a bone marrow broth. It's not a bone broth, it's a bone marrow broth. And a lot of people are saying, well, you know, what is the difference? Well, you know, why is there a difference? Um, well, first of all, I uh, got trained in Shanghai in an international hospital. This is something that they actually feed all of their patients, and I was very curious at the time. I used to be a caterer here in South Florida. Some of you may or may not know the name. I used to be Janetti's Catering. Uh, very high-end, uh, pan-Asian, fusion. Um, decided, you know, did a different route. Became a doctor to save my family. Uh, Try to find other other alternatives to mix with Western medicine. Uh, my daughter became antibiotic resistant when she was three, and I as a mom needed to find some other way of helping this child of whom is nine years old and very, very healthy. So um, long story short, in China, they actually take the bone, no meat, okay? So that's the first difference. And they take the bone with the marrow they put it in a pot, they cook it for three long, very long days adding water throughout these three long days. And people say, well, you know, I make my chicken broth and it's like, you know, just a few hours. I said, this is very different. This is a process that they make to take all the minerals that we're missing out from our diet. So it's extracted from clean bones. These are grass-fed bones that I buy. Um, and they're extracted and what happens is that a lot of times when you try to make it you say you know I really tried it but ugh, it was really bad and I'll tell you why because the oil got stuck it never separated so on the third day or two and a half days depending upon the bone and this is something that we go into our large you know commercial facility and we'll look and say no I need another day um, so what we'll see is that there's a broth and the oil is going to come right up and it's going to separate. And that is what we're looking for because people who are sick cannot drink a cup of oil. And so that is the very basic, basic difference of what I do and what most of other people do. And there's nothing wrong with it except for when you're dealing with someone who is not feeling well, drinking the oil from an animal base is just not what you really want to do. The oil is where, or the fat, or the muscle, or the meat, is where a lot of the injections, uh, pesticide, um, all of that is stored. Now, I do like meat, I like my steak, I don't eat it all the time. I think it's necessary to have a balance. I eat seven to 10 vegetables a day, and it's all about balancing. And I think that when you're able to say, okay, I eat a little bit of everything, your body's going to thank you because it's getting every mineral, every vitamin, everything that you need in order for you to feel really good. And I think that that's where I kind of advocate. It's not one diet or it's not the other. It's just a balance. So enough of that as to, you know, what we do differently, why we've been doing this for four years, uh, and now we service most clinics. We service over 30 physicians where they kind of call me and say, hey, you know, we have a patient, they, you know, they had cancer treatment, they can't swallow, they can't eat, they have allergies, figure it out, and that's what we're really good about. So with that said, I want to show you what our bone marrow looks like. It is white. There's no meat, there's no blood, there's no, there's nothing else. And this is pure collagen. So you say, okay, well, where does collagen come from? It comes from the sinews. It comes from 
I like to use cleaner parts of an animal. So when you use um, like the ribs, if you think about a cow and you use the upper part of the cow, you have a lot of the um, hormones that are running across that cow. So in traditional Chinese medicine, we've always said, you know, use the part that is the best and the strongest. It's almost like when you um, want to buy turmeric, you want to have the best quality, best quality food, best quality fish and all of that. So the best quality of a bone for a cow is really the shank. It's just above the foot. So think about it. They actually have to hold over a ton when they're full grown. There, um, there isn't a lot of hormones passing through or antibiotics. And so it's very clean and you'll see it has no scent. It has no remnant. It's clarified. So it's something that we always try to teach you. It says, you know, if you want to use a neck bone, go ahead and use it. If you want to do, you know, anything. But the marrow is really the secret. Marrow is really copalamine. It's cobalt. And that is really your vitamin B12. So what happens when you consume vitamin B12 or you're deficient? Your metabolism, your energy, your nerves, your stress, all of that is really dependent upon a B12. Um, if you don't have enough of the v component of B, you can have spina bifida when you're having a child. You can have a lot of deficiencies. Autoimmune specifically uh, likes to have the B to keep up that immune. So with that said, we're going to start cooking. So any of you um, have ever had a bone marrow? Any of you make it? Or is this like your first time pretty much? Okay, great. I'm, I'm excited. So... We put this bone marrow to cook. Again, it doesn't have to be three days. You can actually make it for a shorter time if you decide to make it. I encourage you to. You can go to the store. Um, I take the same purveyor as Whole Food um, because of their treatment of their animals. So I, but I go straight to the source now. Um, I do over 100 pounds to 200 pounds a week of just bones and they're very clean. And we process that for general public so take you know one pound today I don't have cards but I will bring some the next time I come in um, but you take about a pound of, of bones you take a big stock pot you put water you boil it you'll see that the oil starts coming up you'll put it in the refrigerator and skim all of that out now you'll have a big pot like this one with just the broth and it's gonna be white again and all you have to do is take one cup and put it in a con little container, put it in the freezer, put it in an ice cube rack. And what you'll do is every time you're gonna cook, let's say you're cooking vegetables, you're cooking rice, you're cooking, think of it as your daily vitamin. You're just gonna take a little bit of it, a cup of it or whatever you set aside and it doesn't have to be hard. This is something that's super easy. Grandmas, I'm sure you asked your grandma about a bone soup, I'm sure every single grandmother will say, you know what, we used to make that. If you think about the skin, uh, think about the, the pictures of people in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s. You'll see they have beautiful skin. They didn't have Photoshop. I mean, think about it. They didn't have Photoshop in those days. They had beautiful skin and they didn't have the thing that grows down here. So you got to figure out, well, what happened to us? What happened during all this time? And I think one is chemical, two environment, blah, blah, blah. But really, they were making bone broth, bone marrow broth. And they drank it every day because it was affordable. So again, this is something that think about a daily regimen, something that you're going to drink every single day. I drink it. I have a, a genetic defect. I cannot absorb B vitamin. This is my savior, so I do not coagulate. So. It's a more personal story as to why I have to make it. So if I make it for myself, why don't I make it for everybody else and teach people that these things can be um, uh, uh, helped with natural medicine. So anyways, bone marrow. So what I wanted to teach you today is to kind of think out of the box and say, okay, I really love Asian food, but I don't know how to make it. 
So think about, let's think about what do they use? They use ginger, they use um, lemongrass. Love lemongrass, do you know how to process it? You do, and how do you, how do you make it? How do you? There you go. Okay, there's, a, there's an Asian secret to all of this. You know how sometimes people like ginger, but it's too spicy? It's like, I love ginger, I love the taste, but you know, I go to the restaurant, and it's not that spicy, but they have a lot of ginger. Well, the secret, I'm gonna share that. It's for free, I'm not gonna charge you. You take the ginger, you take the lemongrass, and you beat it up. Okay, you hammer it. By hammering, it actually explodes inside where the spiciness is released. So now you have a neutral herb that you can put in a soup. That's very simple. You do the same with ginger. You do the same. That's why cracked pepper. Think about it. You know those little things that they crack? They're doing the same thing. They just have it in a plastic container that helps you because you don't want to be banging. You'd be, you know, you'd have these peppercorns flying all over your kitchen, but that is what they do. It actually changes the molecular, let's say, structure of it so that you actually can consume it. So uh, that's what I do with the lemongrass. That's what I do with the ginger. And people say, gosh, you know, it's not that spicy, but it's palatable. It's delicious. It's great for upper respiratory. It's great for sinuses. It's great for infections. So, you know, so Asian soup, this is how we do it. So we have a bone marrow broth, a base that you made or maybe purchased from me. Um, and I have a bowl and I say, okay, today I'm gonna do some Asian soup. It's really simple. Probably about five steps here. So you take your base, stick it in, okay? I love mushrooms. A lot of Asians use mushroom, any kind of mushroom. Take a fresh mushroom, chop it up, and what you're going to do is you're going to actually, okay, that's it. I love scallion. I'm going to take scallion. I'm going to put some scallion in there. Okay. Uh, I love lime. Now I'm going into more, instead of an Asian, I could put a little bit of soy sauce, tamari sauce. It's gluten-free. Um, okay, I really like Asian, but today I'm going to do a little bit more Thai. I'm going to put a lime. I'm going to put a little scallion. You just changed the soup that you had yesterday or your meal into something very different. Now it's Thai. And if you look at it, every Asian country has the same base. It's either chicken or beef or pork or fish. Miso soup is a bone soup, but it's with the bones of the fish and also they use the fish and then they purify it as well and what color is it it's white right it's very clean so so this is what you're going to do so here we have an Asian based and now I say you know I really love Mexican food okay what do what do they use they use pimentos they use hot sauce they use habanero they use uh, they can use uh, tortillas and again, we do the same thing. We take a bowl and we say, today I'm gonna have a uh, Mexican-based type of soup and that's what you're gonna do. And you're gonna do this over and over. And when you take that thinking of, I would like to have and make it much more simple, you are going to be able to master the kitchen. Because it doesn't matter what you have in your refrigerator, you will be able to cook something up in two seconds. And that's what we learn out in, you know, doing catering. And, uh, oh, I really like, you know, um, clients say, oh, I really like, you know, Asian base. But, but okay, we take the base and we just change it up a bit. So I wanted to ask um, Italian. Italians use a lot of basil. Did you know that basil is really good for anti-inflammatory, especially for the feet? It's really good. You know, sometimes you get out of bed and you say, oh, I really, oh, my feet really hurt. It's an inflammatory response because all the points of your body end up at your feet. And it's an inflammatory response. And it's the first thing that you need to listen to, a body part that's saying something is not working well. 
You take basil, basil with a bone broth. You take basil with a, a little bit of a lemon, a little bit of a ginger. You do a tea. And these are the simple things that our grandmothers and the Chinese, you know, scholars did. And they figured it out that this combination is going to be very good for you. So I'm here to, uh, to answer any of the questions that you may have or um, any curiosity or um, anybody out there. Absolutely, um, and when you look at it, it has all the minerals. So we're going to go through. Uh, it's good for immune. So when you are not feeling well, you the first thing you do is you know you go to the doctor, you get a medication. The medication goes into your stomach, and what's really going to make the difference on whether you're going to get better or not is whether you're going to be able to absorb it. So think about it. If your stomach is not absorbing everything that you're consuming or the, the uh, receptors in your stomach are not opening and closing correctly, that opening and closing is very, de very dependent upon collagen and your elast uh, elasticity of your stomach, which is why people before didn't need to have a lot of medication because they had a bone broth. Asians do bone broth every single day. And if you think of it, they open the pore, they drink something warm. Asians drink, um, I'm going to turn this down because this is ah, boiling. Um, they actually drink soup every day and for breakfast, kanji. Kanji is a, is a type of soup, Japanese miso soup. So that is their mechanism of opening the pore and getting the body ready for a nutritious meal, whatever go comes after that, whatever you add to that. So yes, that base covers pretty much everything. Yes, sir. You know, the question he's asking is whether uh, about the miso soup and how you know it has a high sodium. First of all, the miso soup that you are consuming is really at a restaurant. And at a restaurant base, if something does, is not high in a flavor, an MSG, uh, some, something for you to come back and, and continuously purchase that, um, you're just not going to buy it again. So it's either whether you decide that one day you're going to buy, you're going to make it yourself, and you're going to lower that salt intake because it's healthier for you. And then adjust it for your flavoring. So if you like soy and then you put a little bit of tamari and you kind of add a little, you know, you can make it your own. Um, but that, those are the choices that we have to make as to whether are we eating something for nutrition? Are we eating something for our health? Are we eating something to open and close that receptor of our stomach because I have an ailment or because I've gotten to my life and I don't want to be dependent on drugs? There's nothing wrong with medication. Please don't, you know, take me wrong. I, it saved my life many times, um, but a lot of times I didn't have to because I, I needed to eat better. It was my fault. So you always have to do that yin and yang balance. You know, is it at a point where I do need to seek out that professional? And you know, they all went to school. I went to school. I went to school for six years. We all bring in something to that pot. It's almost like you bring something to your company or the, or the people that you work for. We are all co collaborative. It's all about you looking for that information which is one of the reasons why you're all out here seeking, okay, well, how do I make it better? Why are you here at a farmer's market? You know why? Because there's vendors out there that are getting their, their you know, vegetables. All these vegetables I got this morning. Washed it, prepared it, got it ready for you all because it's available right outside the store. Also understand, it's much fresher than what we'll get in a lot of the markets. So what happens? We get more nutrients out of it. They didn't stay in a freezer for a few days. 
It's one of the reasons why I love farmers markets. I love to be out here. I love to be out here with all of you who are supporting the local businesses. And I think that that's very important. We teach ourselves that, you know what, we deserve better. We deserve really good food. We deserve the opportunity to be as a community, to support people who are out there and they're digging the soils. Not something I really want to do. I mean, maybe in my backyard, but it's, it's not my thing. So, you know, great. Kudos that you guys are all out here. Um, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. The question is, how does bone marrow broth relate to your bone health? It's very interesting. <clears throat> the bone marrow broth, when done correctly, will take out the most natural minerals and calcium. So when we're making, when you're boiling bones for one day, the bone is not going to disintegrate. Specifically from a very clean source. Let's just say that. When it boils the second day, you start seeing that the bone is missing a few parts to it. Like little pieces is starting to, and you'll start seeing like the sand at the bottom. By the third day, for us, you'll see this white film. That is real calcium and minerals. So where that's where we're feeding. So when you combine a soup like this, with something that has magnesium, something that has vitamin C, like a lemon, your body's going to say, huh, I think I'm going to store that in my bones because it has a magnesium, it has a vitamin C, and it has the bone marrow with minerals. And I think that if you start thinking about, well, what am I going to consume next? It needs to, if it's a natural form, it's going to come back to you. It's going to reward you. And that is what we really, really strive for, that you're drinking this. Now, it's not like I drink it one day and tomorrow I'm going to be, ah, you know, Superman getting out of my bed. I'm going to be, you know, out there. It takes time. It takes time because your body has to start absorbing. We start opening and closing that pore. And then eventually those minerals are going to go into the right place when your system is saying, you know what, I think I can... I think I can handle all this information. It's interesting. Some people who drink our broths, or the broths that you make sort of like this, people say, you know, I really slept better. I dreamt better. I couldn't get out of bed in the morning because it was so good. And I said, uh, is there a problem with the soup? And I said, no. Your body shut down because it needed to absorb that. Think about it. If you're sick and if you've ever been in the hospital, what's the first thing that happens to your body? Your body says, you know what? I'm going to either heal or I'm going to eat food. You say, now, you know, I'm really not hungry, but I just, I just want to sleep. That's the first sign that your body needs to dedicate itself to healing versus eating or processing any other information. Same thing happens here. It has so much information that your body just shuts down and says, you know, I just need to sleep. And, it's, and I, it actually happened three and a half years ago. I had a Pilates instructor who would be drinking this in the morning. And by 2 o'clock, she's like, I can't get through my afternoon. I don't know. I'm having a problem. And I finally said, you know, why don't you drink it at night and let me know? This is when I first started. And time and time again, <laughs> now I do say, you know, just drink it at night. Just make it your dinner because you might fall asleep, <laughs> which is a good thing. It's a really, really good thing. So thank you for the, for the question. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I would say just a cup. Just a cup a day is just enough for it to open and close a pour. I mean, if you want to drink more, it's great. But really, a cup is where it's just enough for you to receive uh, your daily vitamin or mineral. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I do. It's a cold pressed olive oil. I was going to, um, I was going to fry some of these vegetables. Decided that because of the time, I was just going to heat up and serve some uh, of the soup today. Um, so to the soup, I'm just going to add again. You can play with a little bit of spice, a little bit of curry. 
it's not spicy, but it adds a little bit of coloring and a little bit of a, you know, a nice taste. I'm going to add probably a little bit of a ginger. Okay. And I have my gloves today, so I will add a little bit of that. I'm going to add these scallions. It adds such a, did you know that you can use scallion, let's say when you um, burn your rice, has, has it ever happened? You burn your rice and, and it has that really bad smell. You take scallion and you stick it in there for a little bit, the scallion will absorb that. So anything that you don't really like the flavor of, put scallion in it and it'll help it. <laughs> or uh, you have company over and you're saying something happened to my stew or something, just put some scallion and it'll start fixing it. I promise you, it saved me tons of times when I, when I started out this business. I'm gonna put a little bit of cilantro a really nice uh, taste to that. Any other questions? I think I saw another hand somewhere around here. Yes, ma'am. Uh, absolutely. A slow cooker is much better. Don't put it in um, a pressure cooker because you really kill it. Um, the other one that you can do, which a lot of people don't like, and I'm going to just tell you, uh, chicken feet. I know you say, uh, you know, I know. I know, I have one product, I have one product like that. But I'll tell you, we spend, I spend two and a half hours cleaning and scrubbing and removing every nail and every skin out of it. I understand, but it is so good for a joint pain. It's so, think about it. All the little bones with all the collagen. It's really, really good. And Chinese, actually, I learned in China how to make that one. And I thought, I won't eat it. Trust me, I won't eat it. Um, but I have to be true to what I was taught. And this is really good for you. So I said, I, I guess I have to do it. If I'm a true physician and I stay true to what I really want to offer uh, the public, I'm going to, and you know what, a lot of people have come back and said, oh my gosh, you know, over time, I feel so much better. I don't know how much more time I have. Um, somebody has a, I don't know when. I thought, oh, okay, great, great, great. Hold on one second. So I'm going to put uh, some lime. Okay. The question is, um, he heard that Russians do uh, actually make a lot of bone marrow or bone broth. And let me tell you why. In Russia, they have extreme temperatures. And what happens is that you're going from a very, very cold, I'm a negative, I don't know, 20, negative 30. And that coldness can actually get you very, very stiff. One bone marrow, bone broth makes you nice and warm and fuzzy inside okay it's great comfort food it's what grandmas from generation to generation have made it's almost like you know grandma's favorite i don't know pecan pie or something you kind of keep that with you um it's also very good because when you're very cold you're stiff and the uh, chondroitin, the, uh, all the minerals that it has will help you with your joints. And so that's something like the borscht and um, just all over the world. Uh, you know, I did a, a study and it's er, uh, Sancocho, eh, Caracu, eh, in Argentina, in, in, um, in Chile, Sopa de Caracu, right? Your grandmother made it, right? I'm sure. Did you drink it? Yeah. Absolutely. I, you know why? The, look, he's strong. Did you guys see him? He's a nice, strong young man. You know, he, he looks fit. So it's one of those things that's brought down over and over. It's not just an Asian thing. So yes, that is, uh, that is true. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Weight loss. Let me tell you, weight loss. Weight loss. A lot of times it's not about the weight, but it's about the inflammation that you have. So what happens if you decide to eat food? I'm going to eat this today. And those receptors in the stomach are not opening and closing and opening and closing and working the way and, you know, pliable. 
to absorb the nutrient. And let's say they're very uh, stiff and they're not working correctly. This is going to go right in. It's going to either go out or it's going to kind of circulate somewhere in your body and it causes that inflammation. So when we think about that concept, what do we have to do? We have to one, uh, and what happens is that when we're not getting what we think we're getting, and you usually you have these diets that you feel that you're not eating, it's because they never open the pore and never close the pore. How many have you been? How many of you have been on a salad diet, a cold salad diet? Right? Did you feel hungry? Okay. Anybody else? A shake. Shake diet. Very cold. Hungry. You know why? You never open the pore. You need something hot. How many of you take a shower with cold food, uh, cold water in the morning? Freezing. No, but I, not one person has said yes. You know why? Your body doesn't like it. So why are you going to start like that in the morning? Why are you going to start with something cold? You start with something warm. That's why most of us drink coffee. Oh, I have to have the coffee. It's not about the coffee. It's about opening the pore. Really. Because then you can switch from, if it were really coffee, then you can sometimes switch to tea. And you can switch to, like, hot cocoa and something else that's warm. Hot water with lemon. It's like, oh, you know, I start feeling better. I went to the bathroom better. A lot of the things improve when you start that way. So if you start just kind of backing up and saying, okay, how do I want to start the morning? I want to start really good. I want to start happy. I want to feed the outside of my body the same as I would feed the inside of my body. Warm. Then later on you can have a shake. You can have your shots. You can have everything else. That's no problem, but don't start cold. You got to have the yin and the yang. You got to be same temperature inside, same. That's homeostasis. Because then your outside is going to be competing with the inside and it's like sluggish. Oh, I don't know. I just got to work and it's going to be a long day. You don't want to start like that. You want to start super awesome. And I promise you that if you start really looking and seeing of how do I change and it's so it's such a minute so it, it doesn't even have to be this I'm true to my word I'm true to being a good physician I'm true to helping people feel better uh, many years I had a health scare before I started my bone marrow broth business and I I was at a loss and I thought I don't I don't want to die and I figured you know what I have high levels of toxicity uh, I went through 800 hormonal injections that didn't do me right. I still suffer the consequences of that. But you know what? Every single day, I'm able to get up. I'm able to work. This is physically demanding. My pot, I have to move that. It's about 150 portions. It's about, I would say, maybe 200 pounds. Every container is 60 pounds. I will tell you, I, I have no shame. I'm 50. And I got to do this physical work. I'm the owner. I make it. I do it. I produce it. I, I have a team. But I'm able to. I was unable to do that over four years ago. No way. No way. I was four sizes much larger because of an inflammatory that in one year it just went crazy. All my hormones, everything. And I finally said, okay, well, what's the secret? How do I change my life? And I started the business, and I didn't, like, link yet. And I finally said, wait a minute. I need to be first. I need to try it out. I got to figure out if this works really for me before I can actually tell you, you know what, it's going to work for you. Long term, it's going to work for you. I got to believe it. So I am here. I am standing. I'm happy. I'm blessed that you all have come and that you're listening to something and I hope that you all take something one thing just one I pray that you take one awesome thing come out support the locals treat yourself you deserve good food 
Your children deserve better. Keep that in mind. We all deserve better. We all deserve not to be in a hospital when we're checking out. We all deserve a better life. And I found through my internship and all my studies that the food was the number one factor in all of this. And it's in my possession. It's in my hand. And somebody told me something a long time ago. You either pay now, it says, oh, but it's so expensive, or it doesn't have to be. My products are affordable. That was a plug, by the way, just in case. <laughs> Good food out there is affordable. You either pay now or you pay later. Enjoy it. Enjoy it now. So, you know, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So the question she has is whether, do you have to drink it in a soup? Some people don't like soups, and it's okay. Um, can you add it to something else? Yes, absolutely. You can uh, add it to real uh, raw cheese, like a mac and cheese, instead of adding water. Uh, rice is a good thing. I take my little ice cubes, and I just stick it in there, do my rice, and I'm ready. I put a little cilantro, a little garlic, I'm done. Uh, my spaghetti sauce. Think about it. You put meat in there, you might as well put a bone broth in there. Instead of adding a little bit of water, you're good to go. You add maybe uh, fresh uh, tomatoes, and instead of having the can, you know, like the canned stuff, you just add the bone marrow bro or b bone broth, whichever. So yes, you can doctor it up. It doesn't have to be in a soup. It doesn't have to be, you know, any. Uh, you can make paella. You know, you can mix it up. You can take a, a beef and then add chicken to it and then add raw. Like today we have ramen. We have ramen bowls. So you, you just mix it up. Make it your own. You know, you don't have to follow the, you know, the guidelines. Um, feed, just feed yourself good stuff. So any other questions? I'm going to prepare this. Yes, ma'am. High in protein. Um, it is high in protein for a plain broth, but not as high as a bone broth. Um, you just have to look at it a little bit different. It's interesting because m the bone marrow doesn't really fall under meat. It actually falls under a healthy fat. That's why my license is actually under agriculture. I'll tell you a very interesting story. I, they had to, the agriculture and USDA department had to look and see where bone marrow, and it took them five months when I first started, because I wanted to get the license. Couldn't tell where I landed, whether it was USDA or agriculture. And the reason why they have a, a, had a problem, which is I think is very funny, um, it was painful at the time, but looking back, I'm the only one in the US who makes this product the way I do. So they had to, I have an opinion letter from USDA saying, you know what, you fall under USDA. These are your guidelines. Now you can start business. So I'm proud that it, it, it you know, it was born in Miami. <laughs> so if you ever say, you know what, we have the beaches, we have, you know, you can also say, you know what, we also have bone marrow. Go ahead, plug it in. Please do. <laughs> Um, but anyways, uh, so I'm going to uh, prepare this real quick. I'm going to serve. Uh, remember, these are very low in salt. So if you want, you're more than welcome to have a little bit more salt. I always say salt is really not that great for you. Um, and also, uh, I am available. The, my products are available at all five Milums in the frozen section. Frozen, they have no preservatives, additives, or colorants in the frozen section. It's the only way I'm able to move my product. I, d I decided I'm not adding any anything to it. Um, I am at Beehive Natural Food, local business out here. I'm uh, at another other, you know, farmer's markets. And I'm at six clinics. So you basically walk into the doctor's office, you're feeling really bad. I'm working on pharmacists now. Uh, I feel really bad and say, you know, I just need to go home. I just need to go to bed, you know. They'll give you a They'll give you some soup. Yeah, those are awesome doctors. They're my colleagues, too. Um, and they've been doing it for three years, so I have about six of them now. 
uh, and two of them are for cancer. So that's kind of, you know, where I've fallen in. And I have to mention the part that I never thought that my business would fall under, and it's something that I want you to all think about whether you buy it from me or you don't. If you have someone who's um, kind of checking out, the only thing that they will be able to consume is a broth. So make it for them. It's comfort food. Mine's available, but please make it for them because sometimes they are not able to swallow. They can just drink a few ounces at a time. And I never realized that my business was going to be visiting people and doing their home deliveries and sometimes not being called and doing a follow-up. I'm sorry they passed. I'm grateful that I can fall under something so beautiful. Uh, it's painful. I get attached to the families a lot of times. And sometimes I joke, what doctor makes ho uh, house calls these days? I love it. I get notoriety. Oh, the doctor's here. <laughs> um, and it's great because I get to come to your house. And, and not all the time, but I get to come to your house and I get to really, really hug you and say, hey, you know, how are you doing today? And that's what my business is all about, seeing that you're a good that um, whether you buy it for a short time, long term, whatever it is, you know what, we made that connection and I'd love to continue making that connection. I'm available um, for any questions that you may have. It's soup to bones. Think of uh, soup to nuts, soup to bones .com. Um, I'm uh, educating a lot of people out here. So just, you know, go in. I have Instagram, I have Facebook, bone soup, um, all over the place. Uh, I just did Jimmy Suffalo show and it's really informative. So I'm going to go ahead and serve this for all of you. So give me a second. And any other further questions? I am. South Miami. Absolutely. Okay. Let me just taste this real quick. And I think uh, we have an assistant out here. I got to taste this if this is okay. I think it's good. Okay. I think we're ready. Let me get this for you. I do, I do. Just go on the website and you'll find lots of different. Soup to bone, you know what? The concept of soup to bones basically is that it's vegetables and it comes in. When you buy my base, I had to figure out how to give people who buy 30 and 40 and drink that's all they can drink again in that other category are very ill or allergies I had to figure out how to change the flavor for them so they'll buy a vegan soup and then they'll match it with a bone marrow so one uh, season like I have um, pumpkin pumpkin and spice and they'll put a bone marrow with it I'll have mushroom mushroom medley vegan me uh, medley with port wine that I mix and they mix a bone marrow with it. So, it, you know, it's up to you. So you sell the dough, yes. like a vegan dough, and then you yeah. buy that. Or just, if you're vegan, just drink it like that. Uh, you know, I try to, and I also have kosher. Kosher, I have a rabbi that comes out and it's more, I don't, I don't profit from it. I don't profit from it, I will tell you honestly. But I think that as a physician, again, my model, I don't believe that because you have a religion, you should not have something that's good for you and for you to be able to feel good, you know, like better. So I've made it a point, it took me eight months to get these rabbis on board to help me to provide a bone marrow kosher broth with a kosher bones. It is very difficult to make from the time that I have to order it from a kosher butcher. Box has to be sealed. It has to be transported in the right way. It has to be warm. I mean, a cold um, rabbi will open the box. He will inspect it, take pictures. I get a certificate. He's there from beginning to end, closes shop, locks it. I can't get in until the next day, over 24 hours. It's actually a place, thank you. I, can you guys help me with a, okay. Maybe the name of okay. Um, thank you. Um, it's 24 hours 
and we decided that we're going to do it in the in the oven and the bones are very different very different and the way that they process and they you know it's all about religion and I, don't, I really don't think you know and if there's another religion out there I will strive to make sure that everyone has it's almost like equal rights but equal rights for bone marrow broth you know there's no discrimination whether I make money or not Everyone should have it. So um, they decided uh, rabbis in Chicago finally came to the point that I'm doing a mitzvah. I had to learn about this. A mitzvah. That is a good deed. So they helped me. Uh, I fall into an interesting category. Even for high holidays, they give me a break. And they come with a big smile on their face and say, you know what? This will help a lot of people. So when you know, and, and I'm glad that we're taking this time for you to get to know me and, and what I do and why it's so important and why I make sure that it is affordable for everyone. I sell the soups here at $6 for a double portion of soups. Outside in the stores, they're about 7 and change. And I think it's so much less than the $12 package you're going to buy from name brands. Uh, nothing against them, but we're just in a different plane. Um, and I'm about um, helping my community. I have my beautiful daughter out here um, who has benefited throughout all these years. And the day of tomorrow, I always say, you know what? You, people s continue to um, support me. Uh, this is going to be your business one day. So as a woman owner... Uh, a mom, I think that it's important that we teach our children. She knows how to run a credit card. She knows how to do a marketing. She she will actually tell you everything about the bone marrow and why she drinks it every single day. So let me tell you, moms, grandmas out there that need to, to make a good, wholesome uh, lunch. My, my daughter goes to an amazing school, Sunrise. It's a Waldorf system. They literally have to pack their own, uh, their own lunches. Um, nothing over seven grams of sugar can go in their lunch, and nothing packaged, really. So I got to chop every single day. I take a big thermos, and you can do it for work. Take a big thermos. You put your broth. You have some vegetables, like leftovers. Stick it in there, too, because it's nice and hot. You can put some ramen, some noodles, some spaghetti, whatever it is. Stick it in there. Close the top, and you have such an amazing, amazing lunch when you get to work and I think that you can just sit there and say you know what I feel cared for when you're sick you don't want an ice cream my daughter maybe but I don't think you would I think most of you will say you know I just want some soup how many of you well except for maybe you you're like on the edge right there right you're okay <laughs> right right but when you're sick there you go chicken noodle soup right here is there anybody in here who has never had a soup? I don't think I've ever seen a crowd that's never, ever had a soup. Look, all of you have had a soup, right? There you go. And most of you, when you're sick, when you're like feeling, uh, you know, when sunny Florida is not sunny Florida and it's, you know, dreary outside, it's very few days, but it does affect us. Um, and we'll have, yes, ma'am. The magnesium. Um, I'm always confused because I deal with a lot of minerals. I'd have to look that up for you. I'd be more than happy to answer that question for you. Um, I would rather answer it correctly for you. So I'm going to give you my card, and I will help you through that. Uh, right now, I can't think of it. I just think of it as a whole, and, you know, everything goes into the pot. There you go. My manager just gave you a card. There you go. Anyway, I think, uh, how are we on time today? Just with a broth. It was already done the three days. And then uh, you saw me make it. I had nothing in it. I just made it for you. Just like that. Simple. And look, smell it. It doesn't smell like me. It, it's clean. So thank you. Okay. So again, Today's the end of my show. I want to thank every single one of you, and I'm looking at everybody's eyes because it's important. This is a Chinese theory of look at the eyes, 
say I'm grateful. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Enjoy your day. Bye, everyone.